What if I told you that the brain could be described using just a set of mathematical equations? My fascination with the human brain began as a young student volunteering in a psychiatric ward. There, I met a woman who had an incredible talent. She was able, from a first encounter, to see through the mask of social convention the essence of a person. She had an incredible intuition, an almost instinctive way of understanding others. She could literally read people's minds, patients or doctors. At the same time, she heard voices, had violent outbursts that led to her confinement in a padded room where she rocked back and forth or stood motionless for hours. How could this woman, on the one hand, have such an incredible talent but be so profoundly impaired in another domain? How is her perception of the world different from mine? I really wanted to understand her. Now, a decade later, I study how we read people's intentions during social interactions. I want to understand how the brain represents other minds. In other words, what does it mean to have a good theory of mind, to be able to put, to put oneself into another person's shoes? What made this woman, woman's talent so incredible? My research collaborators and I found something really exciting. What if I told you that this complex cognitive process, theory of mind, and its neural representation can be actually translated into a set of mathematical equations? This mathematical model says that we simulate a person in our minds. Now, let's put it into context. Imagine the following scenario. Zurich is your new home, and you have to make an important decision. For instance, what health insurance to apply for, or um, what bank account to open. I'm giving you advice. Choose option A, not B. Of course, you would like to alleviate uncertainty and become more informed, so you take my advice into consideration. However, you have no idea beforehand how informed I am or, or how trustworthy I am in the first place. Over the course of our interaction, that is me giving you advice several times, you form a mental representation or a sculpture of me my intentions and the accuracy of my advice in your minds. So essentially, what our mathematical model says is that we start with a coarse representation of another person, and over um, social exchange, we sculpt it element by element until this representation starts resembling the person we actually interact with. The graphs on the right show how, through social interaction, this representation becomes more crisper. These graphs become more stable as you become better able to understand the goodness of my advice and my intentions. So what does this mathematical model actually do? It says that we start with a set of sensory inputs. For instance, the image of me giving this talk today. You integrate this information with previous experience. This could be distant episodes from um, your youth, for example, your first encounter with public speaking or more recent episodes, such as the journey you took this morning to arrive here. You integrate these two sources of information to make sense of the world around you, to create new experiences. But what does our model actually do? Well, it represents learning about intentions and advice as hierarchically coupled processes. These processes evolve over time, evolve, as people engage in social interactions as they learn. The dynamics of these processes are determined by mathematical parameters. Take, for example, the parameter kappa. Parameter kappa describes how we use our internal representation of another person to make sense of their advice. These mathematical parameters are different for different individuals. They are, in a way, um, learning fingerprints because they describe one's own unique learning style. Now, we can also look at how the brain represents um, these mathematical equations and how it learns to simulate other minds. We do that by measuring brain activity using magnetic resonance imaging. And we can apply these very same mathematical equations to make sense of the brain activations. Let's start by navigating from the back of the brain. The brain regions in orange depict increases in neural activity. 
By applying these mathematical equations to understanding brain function, we can actually delineate the different stages of theory of mind processing. Let's start with the first stage. That is, paying attention to a person's eyes and looking at the direction of their gaze. We see that this process is captured in the eye and face um, regions of the brain. This is the initial stage. And then we move on to something more sophisticated, such as reading a person's mood based on their body language, facial expression. This is represented in multimodal brain regions, as well as emotional centers in the cortex. Now, we get closer to the most sophisticated stage, and that is being able to simulate a person in your mind and predict their decisions or what future actions they will take. And this is represented in the most frontal part of the brain, the executive center. Now, my research collaborators and I have combined these two methods, learning models, um, mathematical models that describe how people learn, with methods of recording brain activity to identify at least two different types of learners. For instance, the first type. These are individuals that represent advice in exactly the same brain regions that have been previously associated with mentalizing and theory of mind processes. I mentioned the parameter kappa earlier. This tells us about how we use our internal representation of another person to make sense of the social cues, such as advice. These individuals have high values of kappa. It means that they use this internal representation and they seek out social cues because they can put them into a context. However, there is also a second type of learner, people that represent advice in general purpose brain areas that are not, in fact, associated with theory of mind processes. These are individuals that have low levels of kappa. What it means is that they're not attending as much to social cues because they don't have an internal representation in which to place them. Now, what is the distinguishing feature between these two types of learners? Well, that is the connectivity between brain regions, in particular, regions that comprise a theory of mind network. We know that these regions become more efficient at communicating with each other in type 1 learners over the course of the social interaction. However, for those individuals that cannot build an internal representation of somebody's intentions, these regions are disconnected. Now that we have um, this mathematical model in place, we can ask some very interesting questions. For instance, what happens when things break down? So we know that social cognition is particularly impaired in psychiatric disorders. Take, for instance, schizophrenia. One distinguishing feature of this disorder is the perception that people are secretly plotting against you, is this emergence of paranoid ideas about people's intentions. On the other side of the spectrum, there is autism. Individuals with autism do not very much enjoy engaging in social interactions and have difficulty making sense of people's intentions, predicting their actions. Now, we can use um, this mathematical approach to cast hypotheses and predictions about the mechanisms that underlie these symptoms that we observe in psychiatric populations. For instance, schizophrenia. Our model would predict that individuals with schizophrenia start with a displaced negative prior expectation about people's intentions, that they are negative, that they are um, evil, so to say, but that these initial expectations do not change in spite of this confirming evidence. As you can see with the graph below, learning is very much reduced. They don't want to re-examine these initial beliefs. Now, in the context of autism, our mathematical model would predict that perhaps individuals with autism cannot make sense of people's intentions because over the course of the social interactions, people's facial expressions and moods are changing so rapidly that they are perceived as being too volatile, making it difficult to form this consistent internal representation. Putting people into a social context allows us to understand how the brain simulates other minds. And because social cognition is especially vulnerable in psychiatric populations, it could be a very uh, great tool in order to understand 
the, uh, the pathophysiological mechanisms underlying psychiatric disorders. So I propose that we really need um, a deep mathematical understanding about how the brain actually learns in a social context. And this understanding would pave the way of uncovering the mechanisms that underlie psychiatric disorders such as autism and schizophrenia. Understanding maladaptive behavior by using a mathematical microscope instead of descriptive categories, we can design better experiments. We can design longitudinal studies in which we can predict if patients might relapse in the future or if individuals who are at risk will develop the disorder in the first place. By looking at mechanisms using a mathematical perspective, we can objectively and precisely test whether individualized treatments would work. These could be pharmacology-based and cognitive behavioral therapy-based. Think of the difference this might make for patients, especially in the, in the context of this um, woman that I met 10 years ago. It would make a huge difference because these types of treatments would target their specific impairment and not impacting on other existing exceptional skills. So I hope that today, I've shown you how we can build a mathematical microscope that would allow us to look through the curtain of symptoms onto mechanisms, mechanisms that underlie psychiatric disorders. Thank you very much.